I think it, uh, the rate that it's become part of the Linux kernel and part of distributions really ref reflects how in high regards and it's an important technology just to the, the broad community as well. So pass it over to Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. So uh, I can get started. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about how you can store virtual machines in Zinder with uh, Ceph and uh, Ceph's block device, RBD. So first I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of Ceph, where we come from, why Ceph was created. So if you look at the current state of storage, you can buy these gigantic um, storage appliances where you, you get a first petabyte and it costs some bazillion number of dollars from some storage vendor, but then you're kind of stuck. What happens when you want to get your next petabyte, when you want to grow? Well, you're, you're going to probably have to go to back to the same vendor, and you're stuck with the same price with the same old uh, old kind of system. You can't easily upgrade a single component of it. You can't add more RAM. And this is kind of odd, because these systems are actually uh, like pr uh, computers these days. They're actually regular servers running Linux or some other common uh, sort of operating system underneath but you can't actually interact with them. When you have encounter problems or you, when you want to use something that you can't that they don't provide directly, there's really no nowhere for you to go. You have to go directly to the, that single vendor, kind of locked in. So that's kind of the genesis of Ceph. In addition, we noticed that when you have lots of these little uh, spinning blessed record players in in production and you have millions and millions of them, they tend to fail quite often. If you have about a million disks, you'll expect to see about 55 disks fail every single day. That means you're going to have huge replacement wastes. And um, at, if you, when you're replacing things by buying a whole petabyte at once, it just doesn't scale. So that is where Ceph comes from. Ceph is designed for scalability, for having no single point of failure. Um, and it's entirely based on software, so you don't have to keep buying, um, being locked into one single har hardware vendor and you can always upgrade and tweak it yourself. And it's designed to be self-managing as well. So whenever some part of the system goes down, one disk fail, and you're having uh, hundreds of or tens of disks fail every single day, you don't want to have to go and manually replace those yourself. You want a storage system that can handle that. Additionally, we like to source the system to be open source, because we really believe that open source is the best way to grow a storage solution. It's, be it's really the best way to, in fact, um, it's, it's the, the entire future of the storage industry lies in open source. And today, you're stuck with these giant proprietary um, chunks of storage, but these can be uh, they're really difficult to use and hard to grow. But open source really lets any, anyone um, take ownership of their storage and use their storage to its full potential. So here's a basic outline of Ceph. There are several different components. The most basic layer underlying everything is Rados, the object store. On top of that, there are several different interfaces you can interact with the object store. There's a POSIX compliant file system at the very top. There's a block device called RBD. There's a gateway which provides a RESTful interface to the object store. Or there's just a direct library access. So let's talk a little bit about how this object store works. On each uh, storage node, you'll have many disks. And on top of each disk, you'll have some kind of file system regular Linux file system like ext4, butterfs, or xfs, anything that export supports expanded attributes. And running on top of these file systems, you'll have an object storage daemon, or OSD. And each of these OSDs um, stores data in, a, in its local file system, represents uh, th th those files as objects. So when you go to interact with the cluster, you're talking through uh, some native Ceph client, and you're interacting with all of the storage servers potentially at once. So you can leverage the full power of your cluster from your, a single application. So there are two basic types of, of, of daemons in Ceph. There are monitors, which maintain basic cluster status, like which nodes are up or down, um, how many nodes there are, uh, where the data should be placed at this, at this time. But they're not in the data path. They just maintain, um, they, they, they maintain, maintain who is in the cluster. The object storage daemons, they're the other ones that actually store the data and serve it. And they serve it directly to the clients. So clients will connect to the OSDs, um, write to them, 
I have the data replicated by the OSDs automatically. And the OSDs are, uh, are um, deal with failure themselves, so they're intelligent. They uh, detect failure among themselves with the Gothic protocol, and th they re replicate data as, as needed to ensure strong consistency. So whenever something goes down, um, the OSDs will notice and deter uh, determine which e exactly where data needs to, be, needs to go so that it can be uh, re replicated to the proper number of replicas. So one problem that comes up with a, a gigantic distributed storage system when you have many, many servers is how do you find your data? Well, one way to do it is to write it down somewhere, a lookup table. And every time your, your client goes to access the data, it has to know that that data, go to the lookup table and see where the data is. Well, that's fine for a small system, but as you grow, maintaining this lookup table and making it consistent for, uh, maintaining that consistent view for, uh, throughout the system um, becomes more and more expensive. So one common thing that's done is, is uh, this consistent hashing which is where you say, okay, if it starts with F, my data goes into that bucket, and it's stored on these, these object storage units. And that is great, unless you have a whole bunch of objects that start with F. Then you have nothing else and stored never anywhere else. So this is um, where what Seth decided on, something called crush. In order to place uh, an object in Seth, um, you take the object name, you hash it, and that becomes part of a placement group. And then you um, add as an input to the crush function, this placement group, a cluster state, wh which are known as up or in, and a set of policies that define where your data is placed, like how many times it's replicated, and uh, how whether it, it's replicated across different racks or rows. So you put in an, an object name into crush, um, it gets hashed into a PG, and then these PGs placement groups get placed on uh, different OSDs. Now you'll notice that they're distributed pseudo-randomly. It's not like this OSD is an ex exact copy of this OSD. It's a, this placement group is a co copy of this one, and this red guy over here is a copy of this one. So they, these aren't mirrored pairs or anything like that. One of the great benefits of Crush is that because it's a, a, a pseudo-random placement algorithm that's stable, whenever you add more storage or remove a node, it migrates the minimal amount of data. So this, the placement algorithm is stable in that if, you, um, if a node goes down, the existing set of nodes will stay the same, um, but the, 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 so the one node that um, went down will be subtracted. And if you add a new node, um, the, the existing knockings will stay the same as well, with um, some small amount of rebalancing. Now Crush is pretty powerful. It, can, uh, it can allows you to define a variety of rules for how your data is placed. You can store one replica on really fast disks and use that to, for, to serve reads from. And you can store three other replicas on slower disks where you, um, just for durability, reliability. So when a client goes to interact with the cluster, how does it know um, where objects are? Well. As you, as you recall, monitors are maintaining this cluster state, and this includes a map of the cluster, what OSDs cur there cur currently exist, and what the crush rules are. So that, that defines how to place data, how to find data in the cluster. If a node goes down, for example, this OSD dies, um, th the OSDs will notice and automatically re-replicate the placement groups. So this, this one was storing a yellow placement group and a red placement group. And this one, the, re the red placement group is re-replicated over here, and the yellow placement group is re-replicated over here in parallel. The recovery time is very, is very short, because the entire cluster can recover in parallel from a given node standing. It's not like RAID, where you have to wait for an entire disk's worth of data to be shuffled onto an entire number di one other disk. It's many disks in parallel, re re recovering the, the state of the, the cluster, m making sure the data is up to date with the right number of copies. So when, th when, the client, when this OSD goes down and the, cl the client goes to look for it, um, it will get a new uh, updated uh, map of the cluster based on the Gothic protocol that the, that the object storage daemon has used to distribute it and say, oh, now, my, now this data is stored on these OSDs. I'll go to them to grab that data. And if that node comes back up, because Crush is stable, the, da the data will go back to the original place it was. So that 
just readers. The underlying storage system for everything in Ceph. It provides strong consistency. And it's uh, self-healing and it deals with all the failure and recovery automatically. So upper, le upper level layers don't have to. To interact with um, the, the Kubernetes cluster, there's a few different methods. One is to write uh, to use li uh, libradas, which is a native uh, library with bindings in C, C++, Python, Ruby, basically any language you can think of, um, talk directly to all of those storage nodes. Uh, this also lets you um, leverage a uh, actual computing power on the storage nodes yourself. You can actually define custom functions that you can run on top of objects. For example, you could store an image as an object and run a function that generates a thumbnail of it on the storage node itself. In addition to these custom functions, you can actually define um, tra transactional semantics. So you can do a transaction where you do a read, modify, write cycle and implement um, all kinds of uh, fancy things like um, locking or uh, counters that only increment if uh, a certain value is set to this number. Uh, basically anything you want. On top of this low-level object abstraction, um, there's also a higher-level interface, Libratus Gateway. The gateway sits on top of Libratus and exports a RESTful API that's compatible with S3 and Swift. So you can take your existing S3 or Swift clients and if you run it against a Ceph cluster, the Kubernetes gateway is in the way. Um, they can be lo you can have load balancers in front of them, and you can have a whole cluster of Kubernetes gateways cooperatively serving the um, these objects with strong consistency. So there's, uh, you always have to read after write consistency. Another layer, which is right on top of Kubernetes, a relatively thin one, is called RVD or the Kubernetes block device, and this is where it's really useful for storing virtual machines. So the Rados block device sits on top of um, the Rados as well, but it has, it has its own library called libRBD. And you, um, this, this is linked to hypervisors like QMU or so that they can access the cluster directly. They don't have to go through the kernel. They can just uh, talk directly to all the storage nodes and get data for a guest they're running. And because this this they're talking to any of the storage nodes, and they can access the storage the storage nodes from anywhere. This allows the virtual machine to become independent of the host, so you can migrate it from one one host to another. There's another way to access it, which is on uh, through the a kernel module, which has been in the upstream in, in the Linux kernel since 2.6.37, and that lets, lets you expose the the block device directly on the host, just like a regular Linux block device. So these block devices are thin provisioned, and they're sliced across various objects, so you get the performance of many, many spindles on a virtual disk. They also support advanced features like snapshots and cloning. And they let you decouple the, the host, or the virtual machine you, you're running, from the, from the underlying storage it's using. Now suppose you want to run many, vir many virtual machines, which is usually the case. You don't ever want to run really one virtual machine that often. You're usually running hundreds. What if you want to have all these virtual machines booting off of a similar image? Well, with a thin provisioned um, virtual block device, like the Rados block device, you can do this with a Kafka and write cloning mode. So say you have your base, base image here, which a defines like, say it's Ubuntu 12.04, and it takes up 144 objects. You can create an instant instantaneous copy of it, which take up, takes up zero extra space. Then, when uh, your a new, your virtual machine starts writing to this new block device, it will do a copy and write. So, if you write to this block, it'll go back here, read it, and copy it up to the new block device. The new block device. And if it, on the on the read side, the client goes to read from this block device, it notices that it. This, this block, that block up there doesn't exist, for example, it has to go read from the parent. So how does all this all relate to OpenStack? Well, one of the things in, um, that's been a problem in OpenStack is that there's no easy way to 
use block devices for advanced storage systems uh, to back virtual machines. This is a picture of uh, how uh, image, uh, virtual machines are typically created by default. You have Nova requesting an entire image from Glass over HTTP, downloading the image, storing it on a local disk, and then running the, the instance from that image on a local disk. Now, this is OK, but there are lots of, lots of benefits to be had from using some, a blo block storage system like this. For one thing, um, block devices are persistent by default in OpenStack. So you can, get a, uh, you can have a more familiar experience where you actually have data that, like in a database, that stays around when an instance dies. You can even shut down an instance and serve this somewhere else. It also allows you to independently scale um, com computational power and storage. You can have a giant storage network and a few compute nodes that leverage tons and tons of IOPS from that storage. Or you can have many, many compute nodes accessing a small storage cluster because you don't need that much performance. You also get the ability to take advantage of um, efficient snapshots. Instead of um, using an object storage system to back up a running virtual machine from a local image, you can just use native snapshot support in your storage system without any mu very much extra space overhead or time. In addition, you could have different types of storage available to a compute node. You could have some fast, some slow, some replicated many times, and some only replicated once, depending on what, what, what is the use case. You don't get that benefit of those kind of options with uh, just used local storage. So in Folsom, we've changed the picture a bit. Instead, of, um, prior to Folsom, there was really no way to populate data onto a block device. You had to kind of manually ma attach it to an instance, put data there yourself, only then could you boot from it. Now with Folsom, you can, um, Cinder has learned how to talk to Glass, and, gl and Glass can respond back with a full copy of the, da of the data um, directly to Cinder, and Cinder can then write it to the backend storage system. And that's great. Now you, now you can um, easily boot from that kind of volume. But it still involves a large copy of data from Glass to Cinder, which is really not necessary. There's been a, um, a storage backend in Glass since Diablo to store images or templates for VMs inside of uh, various block devices. So in Folsom, if you have the Glass um, backed by the Raiders block device, and you have your um, Cinder creating a new block device, from that same image, Cinder will talk to Glass and ask it, what, where is this stored? And if Glass says, oh, this is stored in the same cluster that you're already using, Cinder can just create a copy and write clone of that existing image. And th 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 that allows you to have tons of new machines virtually almost instantly, using no extra storage, extra time to copy all that data. Now, this isn't quite perfect yet. There's uh, still some enhancements to be made to make it more usable and visible. Right now, this is a, you can do this from a command line or f using the API directly, but it's not integrated into Horizon yet. So you can't do this from the GUI dashboard. But we have high hopes that um, this kind of use case where you're actually u using an external system, storage system, to back your virtual machine will become much more common uh, very soon. questions. Hmm? So the question was, do you change your crush rules when you say you add some more fast storage? Um, how, do you, how does the crush system change the existing data? It really depends on how, what kind of change you're making to your crush rules. So one of the details I didn't go into yet was that Ceph, um, Ceph has different pools of storage, and each pool has an associated crush rule set with it. So if you're adding a new pool of fast storage, that wouldn't change any existing data. If you're changing 
um, if you're just adding some more nodes to an existing pool, it's just like adding any other nodes. And Airfresh itself doesn't have a notion of fast or slow, although you can give different nodes different loops within a given pool. By default, they're 4 megabytes, but it's a configurable size. So you can make them 512k if you want much more, more byte performance but for very small bytes. You can make them larger if you're doing a lot, much larger IO. Do some question marks here. Right now, we don't. We might in the future, but we haven't really fully decided what the best way to do that would be. So the question was, uh, for the Rados gateway, do we interface with Keystone? And right now we don't. We, we're not sure the, what the best way to do that would be. In terms of I.O., um, this is all going over the network. So you can actually use existing network tools to limit and throttle a virtual machine's access. Um, you can also, UEMU has uh, integrated um, throttling for block devices itself, so you can use that as well. There are Ceph limits as in addition to that, but usually you, don't, you want to throttle the entire VM as opposed to an individual disk. Yeah, so um, how you do that, you can configure however you like. It's actually been integrated with uh, OpenStack since Cactus. So you've been able to back your VMs with, with it since Cactus. What's new in Balsam is that it's actually easy to populate these um, VMs with an image. In the past, you, couldn't, you, uh, you had to actually ma manually copy data onto a, a volume before you could do so much. And, and now that's an automatic process. So the question was, um, because Steph is um, swiping a block device over many objects with a block device, um, doesn't that turn sequential read or write into random read or write? And that's generally true for reads. It does turn reads into random reads. But for writes, the OSDs actually have a journal which they can they can they write out sequentially, and so that that keeps writes sequential. So you might have your journal on a faster disk for if you want to have fast writes whereas you have your main data store on a streaming disk. So for reads, um, there's actually client-side caching for the block device integrated with QEMU. So um, that tends to help with read performance quite a bit as well. Depends on what, what kind of what kind of um, I/O your application is doing. If you're doing large I/O, that will help a lot. If you're just doing 4K reads, that won't really help because you're hitting the same objects. Um, the question was, where do you put the copy and write exception metadata for the inversion volume? So this is one of the things in Ceph. Um, we, we tend to avoid lookup tables. So we don't actually store um, an index of which blocks have been copied up and which haven't. Um, instead, we can optimistically, if, we're, if you're reading, we read, try to read from a child object, and if it doesn't exist, we then go back to the parent. Um, soon we'll have an optimization for that where we actually cache which objects don't exist. And in the right case, um, we can optimistically write to the child, assuming that the object already exists. And if it doesn't, then you have to call back to do more copies. Yeah, 
it's all handled on, in that Libra VD layer. So the layer that lets you access block device. So when we say, uh, the question was, um, we, we say this is shared block device, how do we arrange um, multiple hosts for trying to access it? Um, so when I say a shared block device, I don't mean that multiple hosts will write, be writing to it simultaneously. It's more, it's more like a, a, a physical disk in that you can layer like, back, um, like another cluster of viruses on top of it if you actually want to have multiple hosts that are accessing it and writing to it simultaneously. Um, what I'm trying to get across by saying it's shared is that you can access it from any um, individual server. Y it's not tied to a single host. I guess the question is whether we're doing mirroring or not. So yeah, so the, when I say there's no a mirroring, I mean the entire server is not, or the entire OSD is not an exact mirror of any other OSD, but the individual placement groups themselves are mirrors. The question is how, how we tested it in large scale and does it roll over um, lots and lots of stuff going on? Um, well, the answer is that we've, we've gotten many things, um, tested many things at large scale. Um, the virus block device is the next one. Currently, DreamHost has, uh, is running its uh, Dream Object service directly off of the latest gateway. And its soon to be launched compute service will be r is running off of uh, the latest block devices. I'm not sure what the number of VMs are. Um, so right now, the question was, if, is there a, a way to have replicas that are off-site? And right now in Ceph, all, all, all replication within a, um, a cluster is synchronous. Um, what you can do, is you can create snapshots of the block devices and create uh, clones of them in the other in the uh, offsite pool, or you could just copy them directly, and you can perform a flatten operation, which is um, basically performs a copy and write um, for all, all all of the blocks. It'll let you migrate data from one pool to an offsite pool, for example. So the question was, um, what's the what's the ratio right mix between metadata servers and OSDs? And we didn't really talk about metadata servers, but they're only necessary if you're using a Ceph public file system, which we uh, don't recommend for production use yet. The rest of the layers are ready for production, but the Ceph file system itself needs more quality assurance and testing. Um, in general, it, though, it depends on your workload. If you have high, uh, lots and lots of metadata operations, you're going to need more metadata servers, but it's, it's really independent. So you can scale the metadata servers independently of the OSDs. The metadata servers are not needed at that scale. Right now, in 
and Cinder, nothing has changed. That's still the case. Um, it probably will change increasingly. Um, to repeat the question for the, um, there's a column in the MySQL table for Cinder that stores which host a uh, block device it's been attached to or is, run, is uh, created on. The, is being explored as run. Could you repeat the question? The question is whether the file system is involved in the snapshotting and the copying. Um, no, this is all about the block device itself. So you can snapshot block devices, and you can create clones of block devices. Um, that optimization is all about creating a block device from an existing block device um, when, you're, when you're storing your glance images as, uh, on a block device. Uh, it's not necessarily crazy. The question was whether it's crazy to set up your set cluster where you have uh, OSDs on your hypervisor. And it really depends on what, what, what you're using exactly. Um, if you're using, you can't, it's not recommended that you use a kernel client that way because you run into an unavoidable deadlock whenever you have a, a kernel client um, and you use a space daemon and it fetches the same problem, two flag mounts. Um, but in general, as long as you have some extra headroom for the, for the OSDs in terms of the memory use, it'll be fine. What is the requirement for memory for the OSDs? Um, generally, they use around 200 megabytes when they're just serving normal data. During recovery, when they're copying data around, they may use up to a gigabyte. Yes, to be explicit, um, the QMU and libRBD stuff is all in user space. So that's fine to run on the same host as your OSDs. So uh, uh, the question was, what, what's going on with the images being backed by uh, volumes? And the answer is that Glance actually has had a backend to store these things, images on RBD, on block devices, um, since Diablo. So Glance itself knows how to write to a block device. is how does the replication work? And um, it works by the client writing to what's called the primary or the first in the uh, OSD in the group. And that OSD will uh, do the, uh, write in parallel to the other, th other um, secondaries. And then the client will get a response when all those writes are complete. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what, are, what is the monitor for and then what happens when it's logged? So the monitors maintain the cluster state, and they require a quorum, which means the majority of them to be uh, uh, available each next to each other in order to make progress. Um, that's so, to, so that each step can survive par um, network partitions. If you have a network parti partition um, where there's no quorum, where it, um, so there's like you have say you have five monitors, and you have two in one place, two over here, and one over here, and none of them can talk. None of these groups can talk to each other. Um, then your, your, your OSDs will still continue serving data, but they can't get any new cluster maps because the monitors can't generate new cluster maps without being in a quorum. So existing virtual machines will still continue to run, um, but if, if OSDs fail in that state, 
um, they may not, they won't get the new cluster map noticing that there's a few that failed. So um, that's why you generally want to have your monitors spread across the IE domain, so you can always have a majority of them up. The question is, you, if you have a split brain and you have writes happening, what happens afterwards? And the monitors themselves aren't involved in the data path, but on, um, when they're updating a cluster map in the cluster state, um, only those who form the quorum have the ability to update that state. The other ones um, know that they're not in part of a quorum, and so they don't, don't do form any writes. The question is, how does the cache monitor deal with things when the, um, the host is only writing, say, 4K? And there's a couple of things um, by that. One is that the fact that it's split into 4 megabyte chunks doesn't mean that you're always writing 4 megabyte chunks. Radius is actually a more powerful object store than S3, for example. You can write any offset in that object to any length and update any frame you want. Um, so think of 4K, you'll only actually write out 4K to the disk. And the cache is well behaved, so it respects any request requests that are coming in from the rest. If you don't want to respect flush requests, you can turn that, uh, add the unsafe option to here now, which makes it not, not any flushes to add to the disk. Thank you very much. be about 10 minutes till the next session is in here and it's on heat uh, or orchestration within the uh, cloud.